Hello, my name is Wildsdag, and thank you for tuning in to another used book rant. Today I'm going to be covering this book, Never Cry Wolf by Farley Moat. This book I purchased at Coaz for $6.50. I've had it for several years now. I want to say I bought it sometime in 2016 or 2017. So it's been several years. It's one of the funnier books and more interesting books about nature and about predator studies that I've read. So first off, Farley Moat was a Canadian researcher and this book takes place during the 1940s. But he didn't publish it until some time later. This book was first published in 1963, almost 20 years after the events of this story. He says in the preface, Never Cry Wolf is based on two summers and a winter that I spent in the subarctic regions of southern Kiwatin Territory and northern Manitoba as a biologist studying wolves and caribou. For most of that period, I was employed by the federal government of Canada and a report on the wolf studies I conducted has been on file with my employer since 1948. As to my qualifications, I possess six honorary doctoral degrees, which suggests that at least six universities consider me and my work worthy of academic recognition. So this preface was written in 1993. Even then, that was 30 years after this book was published, and Another 15 years earlier than that is when the reports were filed. From my understanding, it's closer to 50 years from when that preface was written to when he did this study. Now, the first chapter opens kind of autobiographically. He discusses his mother and childhood to some extent. And eventually, he says that he spent some time in the summer when he was 18 doing field work in the company of a mammologist 70 years of age who was replete with degrees and whose towering stature in the world of science had been earned largely by an exhaustive study of uterine scars in shrews. This man, a revered professor at a large American university, knew more about the uteri of shrews than any other man has ever known. Furthermore, he could talk about his subject with real enthusiasm. Death will find me long before I tire of contemplating an evening spent in his company, during which he enthralled a mixed audience consisting of a fur trader, a Cree Indian matron, and an Anglican missionary, with an hour-long monologue on sexual aberrations in female pygmy shrews. The traitor, misconstrued by the tenor of the discourse, but the missionary, ignored by years of humorless dissertations, soon put him right. And so you can imagine the scene of a young Farley Moat listening to this older 70-year-old professor who is lecturing three people of very unique backgrounds, and one of them thinks, oh, he's just talking about shrews in the human sense. And the missionary interjects and says, no, he's, he's talking about the little mouse-like things. So, a very funny story, a very funny writer, and that kind of sets the tone for his work. Farley Moat, in his work, is very distinctly anti-government in particular ways. In 1993, in the preface, he writes that most of these fish and wildlife management programs, state and federal government, are actually just arms of the hunting and fishing industries. And at the time of the study, in the 1940s, the understanding was that wolves were running across the northern plains and killing every caribou they could find, leaving their carcasses to rot, and engorging themselves on every single thing they could catch. The caribou population was declining very rapidly, and a lot of out-of-country and out-of-province wealthy people that had been going up to northern Canada to do some big-game hunting of caribou 
we're finding it much harder to find a prized caribou to take home. The government sent a researcher out to analyze the dietary habits of wolves to confirm that the belief was true. They weren't interested in a scientific process of finding out whether it was true or disproving a hypothesis. They sent him there with a problem. Caribou were dying way too quickly. And a cause, wolves, eating them and leaving their carcasses to rot. And sent him to prove it and bring back reports that showed that it was true. And in some ways, he does his research. He does that research, but for the most part, he follows the story, the lives of about six or seven wolves, three adults and a litter of pups. He sets up an acre campsite near their den and observes them. And what he finds is very unusual. These wolves aren't really successful caribou hunters they occasionally get a caribou but for the most part what he sees them eating and regurgitating for their wolf pups is mice fish rabbits smaller game he sees them using different techniques to herd a fish upstream until they can easily catch it he sees them eating hundreds of mice throughout their time and as he analyzes their uh, feces he sees very little evidence of big game and he actually starts to wonder how they could subsist on rodents alone and so he goes and sets up a wolf diet for himself he does away with carbs processed foods that kind of thing and he starts eating the mice that scurry about his campsite. And what he finds is that after some hunger pangs in the second and third week, his body begins to adjust to a very meat and fat diet rather than having carbs. And I'm fairly certain that's one major diet in modern thought, the no carbs diet, and what he does is accidentally stumble upon that. He has the help of a half native trapper that lives in the area. This trapper is off in the woods by himself. A lot of these trappers tend to live isolated lives. He knows two different languages and he also keeps a bunch of dogs. And some of these events involve that contact of Farley's. Some of them involve contact with and interactions with natives in the area. So a lot of this is interactions between wolves and their environments, human and natural. But what he does find is that a lot of the trappers, especially the trappers with dogs, need some way to feed their dogs. And when he's staying with this contact of his, he sees a huge mountain of bones, caribou bones, and he asks, are all these caribou that wolves have killed? And he says, no, these are caribou I kill to feed my dogs. Dogs require a lot of food. And for eight dogs, he needs two caribou a week to keep them healthy enough for the wide ranging they do. And what the trapper says is that all the trappers do this. They hunt a lot of caribou, more than the legal limit, so that they can feed their dogs, their livelihood. And Farley Moet says this is almost certainly the actual cause of the decline in caribou populations, but it is not the answer that the government agency he works for wants to hear. And so he says, realistically, this is what is the cause of this decline in population, but I can't tell them that or else I will be fired and blacklisted from ever doing any research ever again. 
So he doesn't end up bringing proof that the wolves are killing the caribou in large number. In fact, he does the opposite. He says, this population I observed was unable to kill hordes of caribou, but he doesn't actually list the real cause of the decline in his paper. So that's roughly the gist of the story, but a lot of it also involves these wolves. And he named the three parent wolves. He says here on page 90, As I grew more completely attuned to their daily round of family life, I found it increasingly difficult to maintain an impersonal attitude towards the wolves. No matter how hard I tried to regard them with scientific objectivity, I could not resist the impact of their individual personalities. Because he reminded me irresistibly of a royal gentleman for whom I worked as a simple soldier during the war, I found myself calling the father of the family, George, even though in my notebooks he was austerely identified only as Wolf A. George was a massive and eminently regal beast whose coat was silver white. He was about a third larger than his mate, but he hardly needed this extra bulk to emphasize his air of masterful certainty. George had presence. His dignity was unassailable, yet he was by no means aloof. Conscientious to a fault, thoughtful of others, and affectionate within reasonable bounds, he was the kind of father whose idealized image appears in many wistful books of human family reminiscences, but whose real prototype has seldom paced the earth upon two legs. George was, in brief, the kind of father every son longs to acknowledge as his own. His wife was equally memorable, a slim, almost pure white wolf with a thick ruff around her face and wide-spaced, slightly slanted eyes. She seemed the picture of a minx. Beautiful, ebullient, passionate to a degree and devilish when the mood was on her. She hardly looked the epitome of motherhood, yet there could have been no better mother anywhere. I found myself calling her Angeline, although I have never been able to trace the origin of that name in the murky depths of my own subconscious. I respected and liked George very much, but I became deeply fond of Angeline and still live in hopes that I can somewhere find a human female who embodies all her virtues. Angeline and George seemed as devoted a mated pair as one could hope to find. As far as I could tell, they never quarreled, and the delight with which they greeted each other after even a short absence was obviously unfeigned. They were extremely affectionate with one another, but alas, the many pages in my notebooks which had been hopefully reserved for detailed comments on the sexual behavior and activities of wolves remained obstinately blank as far as George and Angeline were concerned. One factor concerning the organization of the family mystified me very much at first. During my early visit to the den, I had seen three adult wolves, and during the first few days of, of observing the den, I had again glimpsed the odd wolf out several times. Whoever the third wolf was, he was definitely a character. He was smaller than George, not so lithe and vigorous, and with a gray overcast to his otherwise white coat. He became Uncle Albert to me after the first time I saw him with the pups. And so then he goes into a description of the wolf pups playing and how Angeline was feeding the wolf pups and then they started roughhousing around her. One of them, or two of the pups, did their best to chew off Angeline's tail, worrying it and fighting over it until I thought I could actually see her fur flying like spindrift. And the other two did what they could to remove her ears. In effect, play hunting. And eventually she grew tired of it. As he describes, Uncle Albert took over. She gave it up. Harassed beyond endurance, she leaped away from her brood and raced to the top of a high sand ridge behind the den. The four pups rolled cheerfully off in pursuit, but before they could reach her, she gave vent to a most peculiar cry. Within seconds of her cry de corps, and before the mob of pups could reach her, a savior appeared. It was the third wolf. 
And then he describes, as he watches, fascinated, as the third wolf, Uncle Albert, used his shoulder to bowl the leading pup over on its back and send it skidding down the lower slope toward the den. The way he puts it, you know, this is a... This chapter has a lot of anthropomorphization, but he says, I hesitate to put human words into a wolf's mouth, but the effect of what followed was crystal clear. If it's a workout you kids want, he might have said, then I'm your wolf. And so he was. Tag was the standby game, by the look of it, but other games were played. But whenever tag was played, Uncle Albert was it. Leaping, rolling, and weaving amongst the pubs, he never left the area of the nursery knoll, while at the same time leading the youngsters such a chase that they eventually gave up. And so, what he eventually determines is that Uncle Albert is probably related to George, then Angeline, and that these two brothers live with their... with. George's mate and raise a brood together and Uncle Albert takes a very parental role but like that fun uncle kind of role with the family and oftentimes the mother Angeline is left to take care of the pups while Albert and George go out to hunt but sometimes Angeline goes out to hunt with George and Albert stays behind and I don't recall reading this Farley ever mentioning a time where George stays behind to play with the pups, but Angeline and Albert take turns swapping back and forth in their roles. There's this interesting family dynamic that he lives with and watches and spends time observing. And this family dynamic, he goes into a kind of mythological discussion on, but in this he's discussing some nation's interactions with and myths about wolves, including a story where a woman found a wolf pup in the snow, abandoned, shortly after having lost her own son. So she raised that wolf pup as her as she would her own son. But the wolf eventually became wild and grown and it left in an area where you can imagine very similar to where wolves were first tamed these kinds of interactions happen frequently it's a really fascinating book i cannot recommend it enough there there is so much i could talk about with this book and how enjoyable it is so i'm gonna close it off here and say that i purchased this for six and a half dollars and I have definitely gotten my money's worth out of it. Never Cry Wolf is worth it if I had bought it new, and it was certainly worth it having bought it used. I encourage you to find this book if you don't have it already, and to give it a read. It's amazing. My name is Wildstag, and thank you for tuning in to another used book rant.